welcome. Uh, we got a, a special treat today. We got tea for you. I think there's <laughs> yeah, even so Earl Grey. Tea for us. Oh, that's for you. <laughs> and that is for me. Um, Mr. Hoogwaard, welcome. It has been four years now since David Cameron announced the, the Brexit referendum. And, and the process since then has been kind of a reality show with, with new episodes coming out every week. Are you, are you Brexit saturated yet? Or are you <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, I don't know if I'm saturated, but it's hard to get uh, uh, a grip of the process. In what sense? Uh, well, you got a lot of noise, a lot of spinning in the British media, a lot of people thinking up new plans, um, and you all have to assess that as a journalist. Uh, yeah, is this plan serious? I, the, the Times is opening with a story. Is that serious? Do you have to take a, a, a proper look at it? So that's, yeah, and that's difficult. It's, it's, it's a lot of ass assessment. Do you do this on your intuition or what do you base such an assessment <laughs> on? No, no, no. No, you can't do this on, it because it's so difficult, you can't do it on your intuition. You really have to know uh, the basic facts. So, uh, what's in the withdrawal agreement? What's the backstop? Um, uh, what was the Good Friday agreement? Uh, how are the positions in the House of Commons in London? I don't do this on my own. I've got a correspondent in London, Melle Garschagen. Uh, also works for RTL, so maybe you've seen him on, uh, on TV. And together, yeah, we discuss a lot about yeah, what's the current situation? What is happening? Uh, are things moving in Brussels? Are things moving in London? And together, yeah, you, you try to yeah, paint a picture. And that picture is uh, uh, pretty dire at the moment, <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah. As you said, there's you discuss a lot, and there is a lot, of, lot to discuss. So we actually want to dive straight into it, given mm -hmm. that we only have one hour. Yeah. So Parliament assembled yesterday, and they um, debated on several motions. Yeah. What did you make of it? Oh, well. Um, we actually dismissed the, uh, the things happened in uh, the House of Commons yesterday because it was uh, pretty now it, it was pretty symbolic. As I uh, explained to Pierre earlier when we met, just before we started, um, the arithmetic in the House of Commons and um, the stances that uh, the EU has, that um, uh, the Conservative Party has, uh, May has, uh, haven't really changed in the last couple of months. So there is one majority in the House of Commons, and that is a majority for preventing no deal. And on the rest, they just don't agree. And yesterday, um, May asked for support. Eh? In, a, in, a, in a symbolic motion, she asked for support when she's going to Brussels next week. And um, a lot of the um, Brexiteers in her party abstained from voting, yeah. uh, because if they um, uh, voted in favor of that proposal, they also, that's a bit technical, but they also uh, would have voted for preventing a no deal. Uh, that's because of the, the, there were several things in that motion, so they abstained, and it doesn't really change the dynamics, I think. Uh, it doesn't change the dynamics, however, if we look at the, the, the Financial Times of today, Header, May's credibility takes knock after PM loses Brexit vote. This yep. was this morning. So yeah. why vote on a, on a non-binding, politically insignificant motion if you risk taking a knock to your credibility? Yeah, we couldn't figure that out this morning, why she did that. And why the motion was in place in the, in the, uh, in the first place. We, we, yeah, we just couldn't figure because it, it out. Because it would have been smarter if it wasn't in place. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't tabled. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Would have meant more credibility for her since she lost some Well, I don't think if the credibility of Theresa May is really an important matter here. Because, uh, as I said, you know, the EU is hell-bent on not changing the withdrawal agreement. Uh, she wants to do it. Um, she heard no over and over and over again. So, if they f think she's credible or not, it doesn't really matter, I think. It doesn't change the dynamics. Okay. Uh, when we look at, 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 at the motion that was tabled, well, whether it was politically insignificant or not, it, it dealt with 
um, seeking alternative arrangements yeah. to the backstop. And now yeah. this backstop is something that we've been hearing over and over again for this process. Could you shortly explain to us what this backstop actually is? Yeah, well, um, the backstop is like uh, the mother of all Brexit problems. Um, they agreed a withdrawal agreement, Theresa May's government and the EU. And in that withdrawal agreement, there's a backstop, and the backstop is like an insurance policy. After the Brexit, they have to negotiate a new trade agreement. So uh, Britain leaves the EU, mm -hmm. uh, and the negotiations start for a new trade agreement. If they fail to strike a deal at the end of 2020, then the backstop kicks in. And the backstop is important because the backstop keeps the Irish, Northern Irish border soft. I could explain more about that, but <laughs> maybe it's already a bit difficult, so you want to follow up? But Theresa May said that the backstop will never ever be used, so why all the fuss? Yeah, well, she can say that, but there, as you've seen in this whole process with uh, a lot of political tension and a lot of mutiny in her own party, uh, well, she can't guarantee anything unless it's on paper. And the EU uh, really wants this backstop, uh, because it's their only guarantee that there will be no hard border on the Irish islands. And also, uh, that means that there will be um, uh, that violence on the, uh, the, on the Irish island is not returning. Uh, you had a lot yeah. of sectarian violence uh, during the Troubles. And they want to assure, because of a soft border, that there will be fric frictionless trade and that people can cross the border and that Irish people uh, can go and live in Northern Ireland, that Northern Ireland, uh, people born in Northern Ireland can get an Irish passport. So that's why it's important to keep that border soft, because they're otherwise they're afraid that um, the violence will return, especially in Northern Ireland. So, so as, as, as I see it, there are, there are two arguments here. There's an ideological argument, which yeah. focuses on the sectarian violence, and there's an, an economic argument, which focuses mm -hmm. more on, on trade and, and free movement of people. I want to I want to zoom in on the on the ideological aspect first. Um, Northern Ireland recently obtained um, a world record for longest period without a government. Mm -hmm. So there is already a lot of political instability in the island. Yeah. What will the effect of a hard border be on social cohesion in the island? Well, I find it hard to uh, make statements about that. Uh, it's hard to look in the future. But if you uh, look at why uh, the Good Friday Agreement uh, um, was struck in 1989, um, that's because of um, a special arrangement that was made between the, um, the government in London and the government in uh, Dublin. And they said, whatever happens to that island, um, if there are things with the border or other important issue that consider the whole island? We have to uh, we have to get a so we have to find a solution, but we have to agree both on the solution. So that's that's the basis, also for the backstop. Mutual agreement. Yeah, that, that there is that there has to be mutual agreement about um, how problems are solved, um, and that's why they th uh, thought of the backstop um, in 2017. Um, and it's been there all along. Um, so, yeah, it's really unthinkable, I think, especially from an Irish and an and a EU perspective, that the backstop will be, yeah, altered or uh, they break open a withdrawal agreement and scrap the backstop. It's just unimaginable, I think. But when we look at um, friction and the violence that you mentioned, we see that there have been car bomb, car bomb attacks mm -hmm. recently. Yeah. I think the most recent one was on the 20th of January. Yeah, somewhere like that. So yeah. do you think that this violence will increase once a hard border is put in place? Yeah, well, you have to imagine how the situation was before the Good Friday Agreement. Yeah. Before the Good Friday Agreement, the Irish North Ar Northern Ireland border was like really almost a military zone. Yeah. A lot of the smaller border crossings were blocked. You couldn't pass them. And the bigger um, border crossings, uh, you had uh, things like, uh, they called it kill zones, you know? You, you, you drove up with your car, you had to get in a special, like, yeah, 
special place, close place with your car and you got bomb inspections and uh, British mili uh, military put, um, yeah, uh, aiming guns at you. So it's really... Do that you think that there will be a return to this kind of a situation? No, 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 because um, mm, again, in a Good Friday Agreement, they agreed that such a situation uh, could uh, uh, or must never return. But, um, well, if it becomes a hard border, huh, yeah. th that can happen, you have to have some checks at the border. For example, uh, if you want to uh, cross the border with livestock. So, and that's uh, what's causing the tension. Okay, so there's this, this, this was the ideological side of the argument yeah. where we see that, that Northern Ireland really... Well, it's not ide ideological. It's, 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 it's really... Um, it's Societal? Really how, would you, how would you characterize no, no, it? No, it, 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 it's really a matter of life and death for the Is British and, and for the Irish and Northern Irish. Because you, you mentioned now life and death. We see Frans Timmermans who argued that, uh, that a soft border is crucial for peace. And all this talk about life, death, peace, war. Um, um, the troubles have been over since 1998, Good Friday Agreement. Yeah. That, that's longer than I have existed on this planet. Is the, is the re situation really still that fragile then? Yeah. Yeah, if it, I don't know if, if one of you ever, been, maybe somewhere, someone here is Northern Irish. I don't Anybody know. from Northern Ireland? No. Sadly, sadly. Yeah. <laughs> but if you've ever, <laughs> you ever been to Belfast um, or another place in Northern Ireland, you can still s see the tension. If you speak to people, it, it's a real s still a, a real segregated society. And is this also something that we see in the public debate? Yeah, well... <laughs> Uh, you got uh, the DUP. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Theresa May actually has a minority government, so With she the DUP. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so she needed support from uh, from other parties. And the DUP, who are the unionists, so they're really uh, close to to Britain and London. Um, yeah, you see that, and uh, they are they are dominating in the House of Commons uh, the debate about the backstop and really um, uh, making a lot of fuss against it. So another, another part of this, this debate on the backstop includes the, the economic consequences of, mm -hmm. of the backstop for both Ireland and Northern Ireland and the UK. Um, now, if the backstop comes in place, correct me if I'm wrong, um, if the backstop comes in place, then Northern Ireland will be part of the, of the common regulatory area, mm -hmm. which would mean that it would comply to EU custom rules, free movement of goods, um, EU I access to the EU internal goods market, mm -hmm. but it also has the political independence that comes with being in the UK. Isn't yep. this, isn't this a, a win-win situation for Northern Ireland? Mm. Yeah, well, some companies may think that in Northern Ireland, but if you speak to politicians on both sides, uh, my assessment is that they find the, um, the peace process, the Good Friday Agreement, uh, uh, a lot more important, mm -hmm. but yeah, there are yeah. Th 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 one uh, one side doesn't agree with the other because the nationalists are afraid um, that they will lose contact with uh, with, with Ireland, and the DUP uh, is afraid that because all of these rules, they will get a sort of yeah uh, another, the yeah not the same uh, regulatory system as in the UK. So um, that they will drift off from the UK a bit. So, so to, to conclude, um, the, the ideological aspects or the, 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 the peace is, is more important than the economic consequences. Yeah, I think, I, think, uh, I think that's really, really, really important. And economics, there isn't much, really much border trade uh, eh, across the border of Ireland and Northern Ireland. It's a bit of livestock. It's mm -hmm. a bit of dairy and cheese. It's not, it's not that big. Of a, of a problem, and you can solve it with technical solutions. Yeah, because you mentioned technical solutions. Yeah. May is looking for these technical solutions. Yeah. Um, however, new estimates have shown that technical solutions can only be in place in a period of 10 years. Mm -hmm. Can we then really solve it with such technical yeah. solutions? Is well, that just wishful thinking? Uh, I think the argument, and the EU already said that, well, you, you can't solve it with technical solutions. Mm -hmm. That was the... F that, 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 that was the, the primal reaction when uh, Theresa May first um, uh, launched that proposal. Um, I think you could, but it's very important for a, techni a technical solution to work if you also have the political will to make it work. And 
that's as, really as I said, yeah. the yeah. EU is not fond of opening up the, the, the withdrawal agreement and altering the backstop or changing the back uh, or scrapping the backstop entirely. So yeah, that's an easy thing to say. It's not technologically possible because there also isn't a political will to uh, do something else than is agreed. And, and yeah, well they agreed it, the backstop and the withdrawal agreement after two years of negotiations. So yeah, it, it, it also is difficult to change your plan when you only have one month or two months uh, if you discussed it uh, for two years. Yes. For two years, yeah. yeah. I think that this is actually a uh, nice point to move to the audience. Are there any uh, questions from the audience at this point regarding the backstop, for example? I see a question over there. Hi, um, shall I hold it up? Um, yeah, my, my question's about actually last night's defeat, and you said that it didn't really change the dynamics much, but do you not think that um, what that vote showed the EU was that Parliament can't pass the no deal. So that weakens the UK's negotiating position for the future and arguably increases the chances of May being forced to do a deal with Corbyn. Yeah, well... To, to pass through Parliament. Good question, thank you. Well, on the first, they already knew that May isn't able to pass her deal because uh, the first one, eh, she tried, I think it was, uh, was in the end of January, um, she uh, lost in a historical way. Uh, and since then, uh, nothing, uh, nothing's changed. So that's, that's the, the first answer. And uh, concerning Labour, yeah, well, that's an interesting one, because sh she could... Oh, <laughs> someone's in front of you. Um, <laughs> she could uh, go for uh, the Labour proposal. Uh, Labour proposed a much softer Brexit uh, than she wants. Uh, but if she, do, uh, if she does that, uh, she will split up her own party because the ERG, so the, the Brexiteers in the Conservative Party, will never agree on a soft Brexit where um, the UK uh, will, align with, will stay aligned with much of the EU rules, will stay in an EU customs union. So it's, maybe she will. Eh? At the last moment, uh, if it's the, 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 the 28th of March, and the ERG is still, uh, uh, yeah, is still not moving, then maybe she will choose for the other side, go for Labour's plan. Um, and Labour's plan is attractive because uh, for Labour's plan to work, you wouldn't have to adjust the withdrawal agreement. So Europe would also be very pleased, I think, if uh, May would go for Jeremy Corbyn's solution. But I don't know if there's any political will. Uh, it's not at the moment. There isn't. She's going back with her own plans to Brussels, not Jeremy Corbyn's plans, but we'll see. Anybody else with a question? Um, uh, let, let me just stand up. Um, hello, I have two questions about Brexit in general. Um, so the first one, would you agree that um, even though there were many issues that stimulated such kind of protest vote uh, in 2016, uh, that's still the main issue that stimulated such vote. It was um, large-scale illegal migration um, that was taking part, especially at that time, mm -hmm. uh, for politicians to campaign on that. Um, and the second question um, I'd like to ask you about so-called conspiracy theory. Uh, you know, such... Uh, discussed theory, normally associated with names like Rockefeller, Rothschild, Soros, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, and by the way, th they, th they still own some, you know, some media in Britain which are quite opposed to Brexit. Um, let me ask how much conspiracy theory there really is among financial elites and behind some maybe newspapers linked to them. Quick, mm -hmm. yeah. Quick question. Cheers. Con con so conspiracy theories that are behind Brexit? Any, any thoughts on that? No, well that's r really, really fringe work. Yeah? I haven't... No rumors no. on that? <laughs> no? Yeah, well, there are rumors, and it depends on where you look. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. Where, where would which you have to look for... In which, which online echo chamber you look 
for uh, you can always find uh, conspiracy theories about almost anything. Okay. Uh, especially when uh, a subject is political or, but I haven't. No, no fun conspiracy theories to share. <laughs> no, I d no, I didn't. F no, no, I didn't find any uh, conspiracy th theory <laughs> that is spread among uh, a large group of people. Mm -hmm. And and what about the first question? Illegal immigration. It was a big topic when well, the yeah, I I, the I, I wonder if happened. it's uh, if it's illegal immigration because uh, if I, I went to Swindon, uh, that's a bit of the Amersfoort of England, uh, a very average city. Okay. Um, okay. I uh, went to Swindon to talk to, p to uh, people uh, also about this and um, I think they have more problems with um, uh, Polish people, Bulgarian people, Romanian people coming in eh? so legal on their EU passports mm -hmm. okay. uh, because of the, um, the internal market um, than with illegal immigration. Yeah. And if, if we look at um, what what sparked the Brexit debate in 2016? 2016, by then, the EU was a bit in shambles. Uh, we just yeah. came from the crisis. From a very a big large crisis. Yeah. Yeah, very yeah, very big, very big political yeah. crisis in the EU. Um, now this is kind of uh, softened. Uh, the EU is doing better. Well, growth is still not there, but mm -hmm. hopefully uh, it will. Um, do you think that people that voted Leave back then, for instance, for the issues of um, legal migration would still vote leave right now. Huh, yeah, uh, also an interesting question and 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 a subject that I was uh, very amazed about because if you it because of the, the 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 political chaos and all the stuff that happened the last few months, you would think that there would be a large shift among voters towards Remain. That's actually not the case. If you look at opinion polls. Uh, the country is pretty much still divided 50-50. Then how come we see, because whilst we were doing research for this, I came across a lot of headlines saying that if people were informed, they'd vote remain now instead of leave. Mm -hmm. How come there's such a discrepancy then between the headlines and the actual polls? Yeah, well, you have to ask my colleagues in, <laughs> in, uh, in Britain. <laughs> I don't know, uh, but, but if you look at the poll, well, sometimes there's a poll that now it would be 46% uh, leave, uh, no, not 40, yeah, 46, uh, and um, um, uh, 56 uh, um, uh, remain. Um, but yeah, it's 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 like this yeah. Yeah. because um, when the Brexit referendum was held in 2016, almost every poll. Uh, um, um, said, well, yeah, we're going to remain in the European Union. And people were really, uh, yeah, uh, a court of guard when uh, uh, later that night um, it, 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 yeah, it appeared that that wasn't the case. So opinion polls are very, yeah, not really a thing you can rely yeah. on uh, if, the, um, if the margins are so small, yeah. you know, yeah. if it's, it's really... Uh, 51, uh, 48, or you know, so. Yeah, I quickly want to touch back upon the first audience question um, because it had to deal with, with Labour, the Conservatives, yeah. and you mentioned uh, ERG, the, yeah. the European Research Group. Yeah. Jacob Rees Mox with his uh, the face of this the European Research Group. Now, if you look at the first meaningful vote, now almost a month ago, I think. Yeah. 29th um, of January, I think yeah. it was. Okay, so a bit less than a month ago. Mm -hmm. um, oh, no, no, it was the, the first meaningful vote was on the 14th or the 15th of January. A bit more than a month yeah, ago yeah. then. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so it much uh, <laughs> yeah. um, In the first meaningful vote, it, ca it became very obvious that the Conservative Party is, is deeply divided as yeah. such. Um, on the one side, there is the, the hardline Eurosceptic Tory MPs, the mm -hmm. European Research Group, Jacob Rees-Mogg. On the other side, there's, there's, there's May and her government. Yeah. Has this divide um, existed longer than Brexit, or Hell has Brexit yeah. really <laughs> caused this divide? You bet. No, no, no. It's it's not uh, a thing of yesterday or last week or last month. For Actually, the, the divide is was there before um, Britain even joined the European Union. In it was 1973. And in 1975, they had a referendum, uh, and uh, people mm -hmm. said we want, we really would like to uh, stay in the EU and even expand our membership. 
Um, no, it's always been there. It's always been. Uh, it's really a, an entrenched ideal, nearly. Yeah, that there are just uh, and it's it's uh, you can compare it a bit with um, with the U.S. I think mm -hmm. if you have uh, two parties that dominate the political spectrum, then uh, inside that party you have all kind of kinds of wings. You've got Eurosceptics. You've got people who love Europe. You have people who hate it a bit, uh, you have people who hate it much, you have people who don't care about Europe, so and that's, but, but the, um, the anti, the Eurosceptic uh, wing in the Conservative Party has always been fairly large. And um, for example, uh, John Major, who was uh, Prime Minister and who agreed to the Maastricht Treaty mm -hmm. in 1993, also had to fight his Eurosceptic wing and even uh, survived a, mo a motion of no confidence. So if we look at uh, the Conservative Party, there are two wings or are there more? Is it really Europhile, Eurosceptic, Skeptic? Um, what, how, how does this division come into play? Yeah, well, I think you have, you have the Eurosceptics, you have uh, like uh, uh, people in the middle, mm -hmm. eh? yeah. mm -hmm. and you have a couple like Anne Soubry, or uh, yeah, no, th there are a couple of others that are uh, in favor of a second referendum. Uh, okay, and okay, don't like Brexit at all. So, so, but um, I think the middle group is the largest group. And then second comes the ERG, who has uh, 60 to 70 members, I think. Uh, and then you have a small group of people who prefer a second referendum or not leaving uh, the EU at all. Okay, um, if we look at the, the, the Eurosceptic MPs, you say 60, 70 out of 650 members of parliament, that mm -hmm. would be like 15%. Yeah. However, their, their influence on this Brexit process has arguably been huge. Where can, yeah, we, where can we find this influence? No, well, the, the problem is that, in that uh, Theresa May, um, um, to get a better mandate, uh, decided to hold elections yeah. uh, in 2017, and she lost her majority. So, uh, th th and that's why every vote counts. And that's why, that's, that was also the moment that the Irish uh, uh, border uh, problem took center stage because she also is dependent on the DUP, uh, a Northern Irish party. So, so she's really dependent on, on two groups that are th don't vote normally as she would vote. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so you just mentioned May and her government. May and her government have been scrutinized almost every step along the way. I think that um, it, we have a, a newspaper, the Euro New European, it's, it's from today, yeah, perhaps you can see it, Thursday, 31st of January, there's May there, <laughs> face, light bulb, everything on it. Um, now, to what, to what extent is, is the current Brexit mess really May's fault, as is it portrayed here? <gasps> and to what extent is it simply a, a natural progression of, of an unsolvable Brexit? <laughs> uh. Well, if I have to mention another criminal, <laughs> <laughs> then it would be David Cameron. <laughs> okay. Yeah, David Cameron just overnight decided to hold a referendum. Yeah. Uh, he expected remain. Uh, 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 it became leave. And, well, almost literally the next morning, he ran away. And, I mean, there has now been rumors that he's going to release his memoir soon, but what is he actually up to right now? Uh, well, he's giving <laughs> talks in, uh, for, for businesses in South America <laughs> and in <laughs> Asia, and I think he's making good money, but he <laughs> has never publicly... Um, uh, apologize? Should he apologize? Well, I don't know if he should apologize, but he never publicly explained why he did what he did at that moment. Why do you think he did what he did? I don't know. I, I, really, uh, I think it again comes down to the divide in the Conservative Party. Mm -hmm. Every time uh, a, an accident happen, happens, it's almost, yeah, every time it's the division inside the Conservative Party that is one of the main reasons that actions are being taken. And also, if we look at the news today, you talk about actions, um, throughout this whole process, May has been accused of choosing her party over her country. And even if you look at today's Financial Times, there's an article on that as well, how she, choose, how she consistently chooses her party over her yeah. own people. Do these, do these claims hold any merit? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's, 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 it's really sad to see. 
uh, that if you uh, follow it really closely and you, 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 you and you see the um, yeah well the, the lines you know behind the games and the, the, the motives behind the games that's almost uh, nine out of ten times it's party politics and it's not only may uh, uh, jeremy corbyn uh, uh, is well uh, the same maybe even worse yeah even uh. today we l if we look at the even the french newspaper it's a headline about where Jeremy Corbyn's priorities lie. Yeah, well, Jeremy Corbyn uh, has, uh, for a long time, Jer Jeremy Corbyn has been betting on new elections. He was hoping for new elections so he could take over. Uh, and uh, uh, all the while, he didn't want to explain what his exact stance on Brexit was. We had a plan, a six point plan, but it was a bit of wool. Um, and now, yeah, he offered May a hand, but with a plan that he knows that if May accepts his plan or accepts certain parts of it, it will almost certainly split the Conservative yeah. Party. Yeah. Okay, before we, before we dive into Labour, I want to turn yeah. to the audience again for audience questions. Anybody with a question? Right here. Hi, so... Hi. Brexit <laughs> has been framed kind of very negatively in the public discourse uh, for Britain. However, the Greek economist uh, Kostas Apavistas has presented what to me seems like a somewhat compelling case from the left that a harder Brexit could give Britain more economic autonomy that it needs in order to sort of move away from the austerity and free market ontology that has dominated yeah. uh, EU countries. Do you think that there's any credibility to this view? No, I don't think so. No, if you, if you look at, um, I don't know the plan, so I'm just assuming or, or listening to what you say and, and reacting on that. Um, I think there's a very big danger that if you, in a country where it's normal to, um, to have liberal policies, uh, where companies are very powerful, if you move away from the EU, then it's a risk that uh, workers' rights will deteriorate, uh, that food safety will deteriorate, um, that all kinds of uh, EU regulations and laws that are now in place are being replaced by worse standards. So that's a very... Uh, it, for example, the ERG, eh, the, the Brexiteers uh, in um, Theresa May's party, they are, well neoliberal, I think, if it comes to uh, economics. So that's not a guarantee that workers can uh, get better, um, better rights or um, that you get a more uh, social uh, society, I think. So, yeah. I'm not very hopeful that uh, it will be better in Britain if they leave the EU uh, um, without uh, any link to the to the EU and to Brussels. Second question, there in the back. Uh, just a few short days ago, the um, British Minister of Defense, Gavin Williamson, uh, he stated that Britain, in case of a Brexit, wants to um, showcase its military might and uh, safeguard its uh, interests all across the world now. To what extent do you think that that actually was aimed at the European Union? And to what extent do you think that this hostile uh, statement to a certain extent is going to make Brexit negotiations in the shortcoming future more difficult. Okay, um, you understood it that you understood it as a threat to the EU that look at us, we are an important military nation, so you have to take us in account. That well, that's your assessment. Well, to a certain extent, it came across like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't think that's the case because we still. Well, uh, after Brexit, we still have a very strong alliance with Britain and, uh, for example, a very strong alliance uh, uh, in NATO. Um, so I don't think that's a problem now, but it could be a problem if uh, the EU crumbles, yeah, uh, if there in the future are more nations that say, OK, we want to operate outside the EU, we want to uh, make our own rules, we have to, uh, our own trade deals, uh, our own uh, foreign policy. So, m but for now, I don't think he meant to threaten us. Are Thank you for the question. Is there any other question? Yeah, there's, uh, there's one guy that. in the back. Oh, yeah, here. Uh, my neck can turn that angle. 
Hi. Uh, talking about the divisions of the Conservative Party, uh, Minister Harrington said yesterday that all these hardline Brexiteers should literally leave the party and join Brexit Party, the new party by Nigel Farage. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is realist, that this is something that can happen, not only having different positions inside the party, but really leaving the party for another one? Yeah, yeah thought about that a lot, uh, spoken to people a lot about that, but it's not really clear. If th they threaten a lot with, uh, if you uh, go for a soft Brexit, if you don't respect our uh, demands, uh, we will leave or we will vote against you or we'll, we'll try to overturn the government. They actually did it huh, with a vote of confidence in, in, in Theresa May or they tried it. Uh, I don't know, but it, on both sides, again, you have uh, talks about uh, alternative parties. Also in Labour there's a discussion about people who are really uh, uh, hating Jeremy Corbyn because they think he's too left, uh, yeah, he's a Marxist, um, they say. Um, so that's a discussion that's, that's, that, that's in both of the parties, but yeah, I'm not really sure if they are going to follow through uh, if they don't get what they want, because you can leave the Conservative Party, but what then is your alternative? You can with the system in the UK that's, that's really based on the power of the two uh, uh, main political blocs. Uh, so you, you get a crumbling uh, political landscape uh, where it's very hard to, you have to win your constitu constituency. So it, it, it maybe then it's very hard, you can form a party but you have no power in the House of Commons or... So they can do it but they also are giving up a lot by leaving the Conservative Party. So you wouldn't say that the Brexit or the new, like the established Brexit Party is a real concrete threat? Yeah, well, and it, it could be, but uh, at the moment I don't think so. So it's just Nigel Farage trying to get involved again? <laughs> yeah, Nigel Farage is actu actually uh, not involved in anything anymore, so... This but he, he is backing the Brexit Party, and if, yeah, if, yeah, the Brexit but, but if Brexit will happen, not happen before the 29th of March, the Brexit party comes into, into yeah. being. Perhaps yeah, it will attract Tory yeah. MPs, perhaps it will not, but yeah. the Brexit party and Nigel Farage will still be there. Well, I think Nigel Farage had a, a pretty um, a big role in kickstarting the, the, the Brexit debate in 2016, but after that he uh, really didn't play any role of significance. Like and David Cameron just... Yeah, they but, the but also because the Conservative Party took over with arguing and yeah. fighting yeah. and actually trying to uh, make the Brexit plan work. I think, uh, thank you very much for the audience questions. Um, I think for now, you already mentioned Labour. I think it's time to look at the other side of the house. And uh, so he there we have Labour with Jeremy Corbyn. Mm -hmm. They have, Labour has remained quite vague on their Brexit stance. Why do you think they, they chose to do that? Yeah, well, as, I, as I, I tried to explain before, that is because um, uh, the main goal of Jeremy Corbyn is not to get uh, a feasible Brexit plan, but, but to um, uh, get new elections. But you're, but you're a political party, right? This is the biggest political decision that has been made in the UK in over 40 years. Mm -hmm. How can you, as a politician, decide that you don't want to have anything to do with it? Is it, is it just... It's uh, party politics, again, yep. yeah, it's, it's trying to um, get uh, May out of 10 Downing Street and, 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 Corbyn and, and trying to take over, yeah, that's, that's been his strategy and, and that strategy has caused a lot of bad blood uh, in his party also. Will it backfire? And, and Will it backfire yeah, in the long it term? It, it, it could, uh, as I explained, there are also talks in uh, the Labour Party about setting up an alternative or leaving the party and setting up an alternative uh, like middle-of-the-road party like the German CDU or, s or, or, or something like that. Um, and it's already backfiring. Uh, as I said, you must not take polls too seriously, but in every poll, Jeremy Corbyn is behind Theresa May. Yeah. So he isn't winning, he, he, he isn't gaining... But Labour is in front of the Tories. No, no. No? No. No, no. okay, no. so the Tories no. are doing better than Labour. Tories, yeah, it, it also to my amazement. Okay, so uh, all this mess? 
all this mess. You can all put it yeah. on the Tories. And, uh, last time I saw a poll by YouGov, that's the biggest mm -hmm. uh, opinion poll, that people would, r th 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 and if you look at the whole of Britain, uh, th so all voters, they would uh, rather have Theresa May running the country than Jeremy Corbyn. Okay. So he isn't, uh, he is doing something wrong. If it's such a chaos, why wouldn't you uh, uh, gain from that? Okay, but you know? he's doing something wrong. What do you think he's doing wrong? Well, he hasn't been clear on his Brexit stance, for example. Okay, and people take, uh, and people... Yeah, and, and again, uh, also his own voters are divided. You have, uh, if you look at London, London has a, 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 a young cosmopolitan uh, a group of uh, 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 Labour members that are very pro-EU, very uh, pro-second uh, referendum, eh, the people's vote. But you have also Labour voters in uh, the north of England who overwhelmingly voted to leave. So he's also torn between yeah, the two groups. But arguably he's also upsetting his own um his own party members, because if you look at, for example, the general election, or, um, sorry, second referendum, he said that if, in the case, if there's, if, if there's not a general election involved, if, there, if, if there's not a chance of a general election, mm -hmm. then a second referendum would come into place. Yeah, but the members on the party conference eh, last year, yeah. the members had to shove that down his throat. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it was still in their, in their uh, party policy. Yeah, if, if, if a general election is not the option, then all other options are on the table. That's what they decided at the party conference. And all options also include a second referendum. Does but it also include no deal? No. Okay, no. so all other options is... Uh, no deal is the default option. Yeah. If nothing happens, the then 29th yeah. of Marth, no deal. March, there will be a no deal. Okay. But if we look at the second referendum, it, wasn't, it was something that Labour clearly vo wanted, or at least a lot of the, um, a lot of the party members yeah. wanted a second yeah. referendum. But Corbyn arguably maybe not so much, because if we look at um, the requirements that he set out to May in, this, in his letter, we see that there was no mention of a general election. And uh, oh sorry, of a second referendum. And yesterday was also no mention of a second referendum. No, because he hated. He yeah, but he hates why? It. But why is he defying the own rulings of his own party? Yeah, well, that's a mystery to me too. Uh, you even had, um, um, yeah, you even had protest signs. There was a big yeah. uh, a protest march a couple of months ago against Brexit in London, and you have even have uh, uh, some people had pro uh, uh, signs that uh, said we love Corbyn uh, and we hate Brexit and we want a second uh, vote. So they love Corbyn, who doesn't want a second vote, eh, want a second referendum. Um, yeah, but they also want a second referendum. So that's also a mystery to me. There's a, been a, there's a bit of a personal cult around Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and I don't know why that is, because um, he isn't sexy and he isn't a great thinker. No, he's not sexy. Um, <laughs> uh, well, it's my assessment. Yeah, okay, okay. You can think, uh, yeah. you can think otherwise. Everybody has but one uh, taste. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, but it's a, it's a personal cult but, uh, and that <sighs> what he thinks or what he actually does um, isn't the same as how people perceive him. So that's, yeah, it's also a mystery for me. Now, given that, that, that Labour, or at least Jeremy Corbyn, has, uh, has apparently given up on a second referendum, is that, is that the end of the People's Vote campaign? Yeah, I think, I think it, the second vote is not a feasible plan. Uh, it, it could be if there uh, 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 will be a, a large extension uh, of Article 50. Huh? If they say, well, Brexit is not going to be the 29th of March, but it's going to be, um, yeah, uh, well, uh, uh, next year maybe even. Okay, so the, the, the strain is really time. For yeah, the, for time the because uh, to in order to um, to hold a, a second vote, um, a referendum is very yeah. You have to be very precise on the wording and all the rules and all the legal stuff. And it, so the minimum time you need to hold a second referendum is six months. Yeah. So it couldn't and happen before the 29th of March. No. Okay. I think before we head on to on to the future, it is uh, would be nice to have some more audience questions. So I see there's a lot. Uh I see one in the back. Yeah. Girl in the back. Blonde hair. Hi. Um, I have a question concerning um, the European Union and all these trade advantages that we have inside of the European Union. And if um, Great Britain would leave, do you think, because then we don't have a block anymore, they don't have um, the free trade, they don't have non-terrorists in the European Union. 
So do you think they would rather um, go to China or the US or Russia, or do you think they would form any other blocks? Because they're not part of the European bloc anymore then, concerning trade especially? No, I think, um, <coughs> uh, I think m most of the British politicians and the British people um, who are in favor of uh, uh, a hard Brexit or even a no deal, they think that Britain can manage uh, on, its on its own. So um, they want uh, broad and deep um, relations with the EU, but they also want to uh, strike um, uh, very yeah, comprehensive trade agreements with, with the US, with China, uh, with maybe other trading blocks in the world. So um, they're really longing for like, they're longing for to be alone a bit, you know, to, to manage it all on their own. And I don't think they will team up with, especially not uh, uh, countries like China, because <laughs> only geographically it's, 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 it's difficult and ideologically it's too, uh, also too far apart. But what think. about the United States? Geographically, there's the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, there, that's th 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 that's uh, related to the other question and answer. I uh, yeah, th they can um, they can strike a, a a trade deal with the U.S., but the danger uh, of that trade deal would be that they lower their standards to uh, uh, those of the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, Eu uh, Europe as a bloc has much more punching power uh, uh, to. Uh uh, resist that kind of uh, development. So that will simply be out negotiated by the US? Yeah, okay. I think so. Yeah. Okay, okay. That will be my assumption, yeah. Thank you, thank you for the question. Is there any other audience I question? I see one in the front. Oh, there. Yeah. Uh, my question is similar to what you're talking about uh, with the second referendum. Um, obviously, there was a lot of momentum building up now, but if there's not enough time, then it's not as, as feasible as possible. So, in, my, in your opinion, uh, if it was still feasible with time-wise and that sort of thing, would you endorse a second referendum? Or does Me personally. It, you personally. Or does it erode like uh, no, the I'm fabric of democracy where you, you, know, no. you take a vote, you don't uh, like it, you take it again? I'm against leaving uh, uh, the UK, leaving uh, the EU, because I, yeah, I personally think it's better um, to uh, be a big block and not have uh, countries doing something else. Uh, but I have uh, really serious doubts about a second referendum because they already had a referendum and there was an outcome and if yeah you, you imagine uh, there are general elections here and um, uh, the PVV uh, uh, Geert Wilders wins a lot of a uh, lot of votes and uh, uh, a year later we say well those weren't really great elections maybe we could do them again it's, it's really, it touches the, 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 the absolute fundamentals of a democracy. And you have to be very careful with that because the majority of the British people voted to leave. And you can't say, well, we're now two years uh, or three years ahead and let's try it again to see if we can get an outcome that is more to our liking. Yeah, I, I find it very shaky idea. Yeah. Um, but aren't you susceptible to the argument that yes, the people voted to leave, however, they did not vote to leave with no trade deal or with the deal that May has? Or do you do think that these, these arguments are legitimate? Yeah. No. No, I don't okay. think so. No. Okay. Because they didn't really vote for anything clear. Yeah. At the time, it wasn't really clear what right? they... Yeah, yeah, well, but yeah. Uh, House of Commons also said, uh, well, let's hold this referendum. Yeah. Yeah? And yeah. so every, everyone, th th for, for every step, there was a majority in the House of Commons. Uh, they voted to leave. So you have to have, yeah, you have to consider what kind of damage you do if you hold that second referendum and uh, you ignore all the votes that were casted in the first referendum. Okay. That okay. could be, that could uh, damage the democracy a really big time. There was, a, there was another audience question, last audience question right here in the front. Hi, that's kind of two questions. The first is we talked earlier about how um, Theresa May, uh, how she chose uh, the party before the country. My question is kind of how is she supposed to choose the country over the party without losing 
the support of her own party? And secondly, if she were to do that and choose the country, do you think that this, uh, we talked about the polls and how she was still ahead in the polls, do you think that her being ahead of the polls is because of Theresa May as a person or is it because there's no better alternative and within her party, if she does something like support the country instead of her party, she could possibly be sort of put out of this power position? Yeah, to answer your second question, uh, I think so. There's no better alternative um, uh, to, I couldn't, no, well, well, obviously the, the, the British voter assesses that uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, on especially on this dossier, uh, won't do any better than her. Um, and for your first question, yeah, well, it's uh, desperate times call for desperate measures. So if it's really, really, really important to deliver the Brexit to the British people as promised uh, and not... Um, hold the country in limbo for such a long time. I really, people, even people from big companies are emailing us, you know, Dutch newspaper, English people, uh, English entrepreneurs. Well, they really don't listen. They really don't understand. All they do is talking party politics, making decisions based on, uh, on uh, keeping their party together. Um, so that's a perception that also uh, really lives in the UK too. Um, so, yeah, it, I could imagine that if I were her and uh, at the last minute we still haven't got a decision and no deal is looming, then maybe I would say, well, the only option that is there that has a majority in the House of Commons is siding with uh, Jeremy Corbyn and his plan. And we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit and he scrapped something away, I scrapped something away and we do it that way. That's compromise, but yeah, compromise is very normal in Dutch politics, but because of the two big blocks in the UK, they're not really used to uh, 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 make a good compromise in, uh, in Britain, I think. Okay, thank you for the audience question. Um, I, want, I want to shortly look to the future, yeah. because we have, I think, four weeks left, a bit more, uh, until the 29th of March, and you already mentioned the default option, that's no deal. Um, we s talked about the People's Vote campaign, you think it has no credibility no. anymore and it's too short. Then what options are still on the table? Well, if you ask me, there are two options now. Um, that's a no deal, uh, because that's the default option in it, uh, at the 29th of March, or um, uh, delay. Okay, and when we, talk, when we look at a no deal, you mentioned there's a, there's a majority in Parliament that is against a no deal. We see that there will be possibly a, a second Cooper Amendment, which entails that Parliament would have to vote on whether or not they will receive a no deal. Mm -hmm. If there's a majority against a no deal, is that, isn't, is, that, is that a likely scenario still? Yeah, well, there already is uh, uh, a majority against no deal, mm -hmm. but uh, in order to prevent a no deal, you have to have another plan. Um, you can't just say, we don't want no deal, and vote for that because there's nothing in place that could replace the no deal situation on the 29th of March. There's one thing, that, that there's May's deal. That's what May is saying all the time. Well, we have a deal, it's my deal. Yeah. If, you if you don't want no deal, vote for my deal because it's the only deal we have. And what about concessions on Corbyn's deal? As you said that compromise is not really something inherent to British politics. No. So there's no like possibility. Yeah, yeah, well, the, 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 if, if, uh, it, if time, gets really short, uh, maybe there is, but at the moment, but there isn't. But isn't time already really short with <laughs> little more than four weeks to go? There even have been scenarios now where um, the House of Commons will be in session on the 29th of March, yeah? mm -hmm. on a, uh, 11 o'clock uh, uh, GMT, they are leaving the European Union. Morning or evening? Uh, more, uh, evening. Okay, yeah. so, so full day the 29th. Yeah, yeah. so uh, that uh, House of Commons will be in session that day to eventually find a solution. So it's ev even those scenarios are circulating now in Westminster. Okay, and if we look at, even if May's deal is passed, all the legislation will have to go through the House of Commons. Wouldn't that mean that even if May passes the deal, Article 50 will be delayed still? Yeah, well, there is a in, in that scenario I just mentioned that, that also involves that all the legislation that is necessary to 
agree to some kind of deal already passed the House of Commons, eh, because they have to accept the bills on, on, uh, on uh, civil rights and uh, a couple of other, uh, other things. That all, all is passed already in the Commons, and then the, the final vote will be on do we agree to this deal or not. Well that's, a, that's a really, it's a bit of sci-fi, because I don't think the European Union is going to accept that uh, London, uh, um, yeah, is, uh, yeah. Why not? Yeah, it's, it's just too insecure. Uh, imagine. The EU is uh, insecure. Imagine, uh, you have Brexit on Saturday, mo on Saturday morning, yeah. or uh -huh. you know, Saturday or Friday night, Saturday morning, uh, uh, Brexit has happened. And just hours before, in Britain, they will still be discussing how they will do that. So yeah. that's, that's, not, um, yeah, that's not a situation that's good for business, for businesses, um, for people trying to cross the border, or, you know, it's too, it's too uncertain. And so, so, we, so we truly have two options. We have delay and we have May's deal, no, no deal. May's deal, you say that that won't happen because the EU won't give concessions for the backstop. So we can basically write off her plan. Yeah, well, as, uh, May, uh, if May doesn't, she's going to Brussels uh, next week again, uh, together with her uh, Attorney General, Jeffrey Cox, uh, who's mm -hmm. the man who knows all the, the legal stuff. Uh, if she doesn't return with changes to the backstop, then the, yeah, the ERG and the Brexiteers uh, will almost certainly say that they won't uh, vote for her plan. There have, there have been rumors that there would be cash for vote schemes with Labour MPs, with Labour yep. backbenchers, in which the government invests in Labour constituencies in return for for their vote for yep. their vote yep. on a on a deal on a deal. Um, if push comes to shove, will these Labour backbenchers accept May's deal in return for the money? Because this would be a possible solution to get May's deal through, right? Yeah, well, it could. It's a, it's a, it's a it's a plausible scenario. Yeah. If you can, if you, if you, for years, uh, promised your constituents uh, a new hospital or uh, new buses or new primary school, uh, uh, and you get a, a bag of money, uh, if you vote for something that you're not really opinion opinionated about, but she won't, um, she won't ask that. Uh, um, yeah, she won't ask the Labour MPs who are really outspoken about the question. Uh, but as a middle group, if you can find 20 or 30 people there, uh, you get a bag of money, vote for my deal, maybe it will work. It's absurd, yeah. I know, yeah. but yeah, yeah, because that's the situation weird, right? uh, it's like almost straight up corruption. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not corruption. Well, okay, corruption is perhaps uh, uh, yeah. the wrong word, yeah. but... Yeah. You it's politics. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> but if we look at all of these scenar the scenarios that you just described, which one do you think will have the worst case scenario outcome? Um, yeah, well, a no deal is the worst, uh, the worst case scenario. Worse than people's vote? Mm, uh, on the short term, no deal. Uh, on the longer term, I think uh, uh, the people's vote or the second vote. But yeah, if you look at No Deal, but No Deal, some people say, well, um, I don't know if you know the Millennium Bug, but that was a big thing in 2000. Eh? Uh, because computers know the Millennium were. Millennium Bug? Yeah, the, 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 the guys in the front row. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, some uh, people say that there were a lot of preparations <laughs> when it's uh, uh, at the Millennium. Uh, because uh, they thought computers couldn't deal uh, with the number 2000. Uh, uh, a lot of old systems, and so they prepared a lot of money and shoved a lot of money to ICT companies and government spend a, uh, spend a lot of money. And some people say, well, the Brexit is exactly the same. Um, there's a lot of fuss about it, but when the Brexit date is there, all things will just flow as they normally do. Yeah. And yeah. So a lot of the people in the UK are also saying, or at least from what I hear from my friends that study abroad, is that um, in the end, Brec the Britain will be fine because they'll innovate and they'll just recover from a no deal. Yeah, <laughs> but they forget that they are like a, a, a small country yeah. uh, between a lot of violence. Yeah. For example, the, 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 the trade war that is now going on with the US and China is much, much bigger, much more important than our little Brexit problem. Because those are the numbers. 
and Britain I think we're is all discussing the wrong subject here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now Brexit is uh, from a political perspective and from the EU perspective, a uh, geopolitical uh, perspective is very very important. But if you look at the economics and the thought of many British Brexiteers that uh, Britain will thrive uh, when they're outside the union uh, because they can do their own business. I think that's that's really a misconception. That's yeah. not going to happen. Yeah, I think that sadly, uh, if I look at the time, we will we'll have to end off today's today's discussion. Um, last question: We have a, a second uh, uh, understanding Brexit session, a second session on Brexit here, room for discussion in in three weeks. What should we look out for in the coming three weeks? What are there special days, special events that, that we should pay attention to? Yeah, well, um, you, all, you mentioned the Cooper Amendment before. Eh? The Yvette Cooper is a Labour MP who uh, made a cross-party uh, uh, amendment that, um, that asks or even that tells the government to um, uh, postpone the Brexit date. That's a very important amendment and they were going to be uh, voting on that well, they think now, but nothing sure, but uh, the 27th of uh, February. So that's the most important data now. And I hope that on the 27th of February, if the Cooper motion uh, uh, gets a majority, that we have a little bit more clarity uh, over how uh, the month of March will, uh, uh, will go. Because, yeah, it's for us also, it's, uh, th yeah, it's just, we I d People uh, at the newspaper uh, often ask me, well, how do you think it will end? Uh, I, I haven't got the, the foggiest <laughs> idea. No, no I, can <laughs> I, I can think about stuff, uh, I can think stuff up, I can, I can you know, uh, uh, yeah, talk to my London correspondent, talk to people who are involved with the matter, but everyone says something else. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, even my London correspondent and I don't agree on, uh, on stuff, so. That's a lot of confusion then. A lot of confusion there, yeah. I think that is a very, uh, I, gu I guess, and a the confusing the note yeah. to end on. Yeah. The gloom <laughs> to end off on, yeah. The confusion <laughs> will not go <laughs> away. Okay, that's, that's good to know. I think before we give our guests a warm round of applause, I'd just like to mention a few things, which is that um, if you want to become an interviewer, Today is our last day to apply. You have exactly 10 hours left to send in your applications and uh, motivation letters to us. And I'd also like to mention that next week, on the 20th uh, of February, we have an interview coming up with the Director uh, General of the European Space Agency, Johann Dietrich Werner, on the future of space. So make sure to join that session as well. And, of course, make sure to join the second Brexit session, with which is on the 6th of March. But for now, please give our guests a warm round of applause.